Hey, this is Joe from The Recording Revolution. Today we're going to talk about my vocal mixing chain, but first I have a surprise. This is a brand new checklist that I created that you can have for free. So go to recordingrevolution.com slash checklist to get this. This has to do with something we talked about in a recent video about the different buckets to put your tracks into when it comes to producing a song. Having a track sound good is great, but knowing what parts to record and what's missing in the song to make it interesting and engaging, that's a piece of the puzzle that a lot of people are missing. This will help with that. It comes with a video that explains how this works and how to use it. It's all free. Just go to recordingrevolution.com slash checklist to get your copy. And if you get this before May 8th, 2023, you'll be entered to win a copy of my recording course, which is a big, long, it's like my flagship recording course. Uh, you get a chance to win that for free by signing up for this. All right, let's dive into today's video. We want to talk about the vocal mixing chain, right? If you go kind of dancing around YouTube for a while, you'll see there's a lot of people interested in, hey, what's your vocal chain? What's your vocal chain? And by chain, they just mean what's the the collection of plugins that you use kind of top to bottom on your vocal track. Now for me, it's obviously not the exact same thing every time, but I've noticed over the years, I've developed a process that I use that's pretty consistent in helping me get a great vocal mix every time. Now the specifics may change from one mix to the next, but the overall principle is pretty consistent. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Now before we dive into specific plugins and order and settings, we really need to kind of step back a second and talk about what makes a good vocal mix. Do you know kind of in your head already what that vocal mix is supposed to sound like? If not, we need to spend some time there. Now don't gloss over this because it seems stupid obvious. Yeah, of course I need to know what a good vocal mix sounds like so I can get a good vocal mix. But a lot of people actually do skip over that and they jump in and they start just throwing plugins everywhere and tweaking and adjusting, but they don't really have a target. So they're just kind of randomly adjusting and making it sound different, but is it sounding better? Who knows, because they're not sure what they're aiming for. It makes me think of guitar. So if you're a guitar player, even if you're not, there's this phrase that goes around that says, tone is in your fingers, specifically talking about like electric guitar tone. Tone's not in your fingers. I would say tone is right here in your ears, because what makes one person able to dial in an amazing tone on the same amp as somebody else who can't get a good tone isn't the equipment or even really the techniques or the settings that they use. It's the way that they hear it and the way that they know what they're looking for. That's the key. Someone who gets great guitar tone knows what great guitar tone sounds like, and then they adjust the equipment, whatever you put in front of them, until it sounds great. That may seem like semantics, but a lot of people want to flip that around. They want to say, what's the secret to great guitar tone? And then enter every forum debate ever. It's you need this pedal and this guitar and these strings and this cable and these settings on this amp, and you've got guitar tone. That might work, but the great guitar players are able to dial in tones that sound really cool because they're able to recognize when a cool sound comes across their ears. It's almost like they're scanning frequencies like a, like a police scanner waiting uh, for something to come along that grabs their ear. If you don't know what a good tone sounds like or you're not able to recognize one if it passed by you, then you're really kind of doomed to always just kind of tweaking and adjusting because everything makes the sound sound different. So if it's better or worse, you really have no like standard against which you're measuring, which makes it a really frustrating process. You mix one vocal and then you send it off and maybe somebody like me critiques it and says, hey, you're there's too much sibilance and it's also muddy. And you think, okay. And then you go like try to fix those things and then it's too mid-rangey. And then you go, it's, a, it's like a never ending cycle. So instead, make sure you focus on what is a good vocal mix. And the best way to do that, go listen to a lot of great professionally produced projects in your studio, on your studio monitors, and pay attention to the vocal. It sounds overly simplistic, but it's it's really helpful. I did this the other day. I was listening to some, I was in like a 90s kick, so I listened to some 90s R&B, and I was blown away by how differently the low end sounded in those mixes compared to the way I remembered them. So like, Killing Me Softly by the Fugees. Like, in my head, that drum beat is like, boom, chi, ga, chi, boom, chi. 
Ka, but it's way more mid rangey. That kick drum does not have a big, deep, low end at like 50 hertz. It's more like a 100 hertz focus. It's more like goom, 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 instead of like boom, 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 like deep, low end. In my head, it has deep, low end, but in reality, the bass is pretty low, but the kick drum itself is actually kind of mid rangey. That's interesting information that if I'm working on something that has a similar vibe sometime in the future, I'll remember, and it'll help me shape that tone and recognize when I get to that good tone. It's the same way with vocals. A lot of times they're a lot thinner uh, and a lot less thick in the lows and low mids than we tend to think they are, but that's one of the secrets to getting it to sit nicely on top of a mix. So... Do your homework, spend time listening to good vocals. It is time well spent, and you'll get to a point where you recognize a great sounding vocal, and then you can adjust your gear accordingly to make sure your vocal sounds that good. You've stuck with me until this point in the video, which means you're smart. Because the people who have already checked out are the ones who want me to give them like exact settings to use in their vocal chain. Guess what? Exact settings are completely useless unless you're mixing my exact vocal in the exact same mix. Otherwise, it's a moot point. Memorizing settings doesn't help you get good vocals. Learning a philosophy and an approach to mixing does help you get good vocals. So here is my quote-unquote philosophy for mixing vocals. It's kind of a linear process, but obviously all of this can be moved around if needed. First thing I do is fix any problems in the vocal itself. So if it has an excessive buildup of low frequencies or there's like a high mid weirdness thing happening when I just listen to the vocal without anything on it, I'll go ahead and it, typically it's EQ. I'll use a tool like EQ to fix those problems. Getting the vocal to sound pretty nice by itself. Next thing I'll do is compress it. To me, the sound of a modern vocal by modern, I mean, you know, last couple of decades, the sound of a modern vocal is really the sound of compression. Now, too much compression is obviously a bad thing, but typically a nice upfront lead vocal has a good amount of compression on it. After I've compressed it and got that nice, tight, kind of squeezed sound in the vocal, then I'll apply EQ to shape the tone further, to thin out the low mid so that it's not so thick and kind of muddy sounding, and maybe give it a little crispiness on the top end so that it's nice and airy and we can really articulate or hear the articulations in the voice over the rest of the band. After that, we may find that with that airiness and the compression that we added, there's too much sibilance, and so usually a de -esser is needed. Not always, but occasionally I'll need a de -esser after I've done that compression and that EQ. And then from there, I'll listen to the vocal in the mix, and if it feels like it's just still not sitting where I want it to, like it's, it's okay in some spots and then it's like jumping out and kind of hitting me in the face, not in a good way, then I'll actually add another compressor that's just a more smooth sounding compressor to tighten up the vocal a little more. So the first compressor, compressor, compressor. The first compressor is usually getting more peaks and it's pretty aggressive. The second one is more smooth. There is a gnat in here. The second one is more smooth. It's not like grabbing it super fast. It's not got a really fast attack and release time, but it's more slow and smooth, which just kind of just kind of chomps down big picture on the vocal and keeps it kind of in its place. It still has some dynamic to it. It's not like crushed within an inch of its life, but it's if like this is the original vocal and this is the first compressor and that feels like there's too much range there, the second compressor gets it closer without it making it feel over compressed. And then finally, after all of that, sometimes those two compressors can really mess with the overall tone, like the tone that we got up here, once we've compressed it that second time, might not be quite right. So it's not uncommon for me to add another EQ at the very bottom of the chain to do kind of the final tone shaping. Maybe pull down the low mids a little bit more, maybe adjust the mids and upper mids to their just at the right spot to make that vocal sit nicely without being too bright, too harsh, or too dull, and too muddy. Let's listen to what all that sounds like. Okay, so here is a typical vocal chain for me. This is from a recent EP. This looks pretty standard. Now, like I said, every vocal is a little bit different, but this is, this is pretty typical for me. So let's go through the process here. I'm gonna turn all of these plugins off, and as we add them in, you're gonna kinda hear what they're doing to the sound. So here is the Raw vocal, we'll do it like at verse two. Here's the raw vocal by itself. You say that it won't be long until I see it through new eyes. Pretty good, I like it, it's a dynamic mic on this one. And I was hearing a lot of kind of 
upper mid stuff that would really poke through when I would sing really loudly. And it was the kind of thing that the compressor was making even more obvious. So that is a big problem that I want to fix. So it involved a couple of kind of notches up here in the upper frequencies just to kind of tame that down a little bit. Fairly subtle. It, you really only hear it on those specific vowel sounds where it was going kind of um, and it fixes some of that. So here's what that sounds like. You said that it won't be long. Listen to that long. It's a little smoother. Here it is without EQ. You said that it won't be long. A lot of kind of overtones there. This kind of smooths it out. Makes it a little darker, but in kind of a cool way. You said that it won't be long. So that's pretty good. Obviously, there's a good amount of warmth and low end we'll need to deal with, but it's not like an excessive amount yet. Uh, so I'm going to deal with that later. So the next thing in the chain for me is a compressor. So I'm using this specific, uh, it's called the tube inside of Studio One's Fat Channel. Um, and this one, I did kind of crank the volume on this. I kind of broke my own rule there. But I got a nice kind of aggressive compression with not a super fast attack and release, but this kind of gives it that initial kind of uh, that you want out of a vocal. So I'm going to start with it off and then I'll turn it on. You say that it won't be long. You say that it won't be long. It's just kind of up in your face. It's not just a volume increase. It's like it gets close to your face, but then there's something kind of keeping the peaks from getting up too in your face so that like the whole vocal, instead of being like some of it's in your face and some of it's far away, a lot of it's kind of right there in my face now, which is delightful. Um, but now it has kind of a th pretty thick sound to it. You say that it won't be long. So now we're going to kind of shape that with this EQ. And you can see I mostly just did cuts here. I cut down some of the lows, the low mids, and a little bit in the high mids and the highs even, um, because the compressor kind of changes the overall balance. And this felt like a good addition to what was happening with the compressor. So I'll start with the compression, then I'll add the EQ. You say that it won't be long. You say that it won't be long. You say that it won't be long. This is where a lot of people get off track. You would some of the people listening right now might say, man, it sounds better without the EQ. Listen to the low end here and the difference in the low end. Here it is without EQ. You say that it won't be long. And here it is with. You say that it won't be long. So a lot of people say, oh, without EQs was so much punchier. It was like, boom, you say it doing Like this big kind of low end there made it sound like big and like in charge and manly, I don't know. Um, and it's the same thing, back to the guitar players, a lot of us electric guitar players will do. We'll set up our pedals and everything with a big beefy sound coming out of the amp. And it might sound cool in the room and it might make us feel more manly than we actually are. But the problem is that doesn't work well in the mix. It's excessive, it drowns out the bass, it kind of muddies up the low end for everybody else. So we need to remove that in the mix. So you can see here, this is a low shelf cutting about five and a half decibels at 220 hertz and below, and then more, about four decibels at 360. So a lot of that low end is being tamed down so that the vocal has a th little bit of a thinner sound. It still sounds good and it works in the mix, but it doesn't have that whoom, whoom, whoom that was there before. So I'll do the before and after here so you can hear that. You say that it won't be long. You say that it won't be long. Now one question might be, why would I do this EQ here? Why not do it before the compressor? I like the way the low end of a vocal triggers the compressor. It causes it to trigger in a different way. If we flipped the order of this, the compressor wouldn't sound as cool to my ear. So I typically, that's why I leave it in there and compress it to get the cool kind of overall sound, then I'll take out the low end. So I could adjust this low end completely out if I wanted to, it wouldn't affect the compressor because the compressor came first, and I kind of like that. All right, so after this, it goes on to, I decided it's even in the mix, if we listen to this in the mix real quickly, you'll hear the vocal kind of is sitting, but not quite sitting where I want it to. You say that it won't be long. You say that it won't be long. Until I see it through new eyes. It's good, but it, and it's some of it's a volume thing, but some of it is just I want the vocal squished a little bit more. But typically, this is about as far as I want to squish on a single compressor. So I added a second compressor and set this one up a lot more chill. So this one, the ratio, it's it's what I call I've called before butter compression, which is just a dumb name. But I bring the threshold all the way down. Start with the ratio at one to one, which is no compression, and then just slowly bring it up. So this one got up to about 1.4 to one, 
and the attack and the release settings, uh, if you can see those over here, the attack and release are set to 50 milliseconds. So nothing super aggressive and super fast. They're kind of just chillaxing here on the vocal. But listen to what that does. You can see I've called it the Butterbox compressor. Listen to what that does. I'll turn it, I'll start with it off and then I'll turn it on. And we'll listen to just the vocal by itself. You say that it won't be long. 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 It's it's not like dramatically different, but it gives it kind of this consistently, like I said before, if, if like the peaks are here and the lows are here, they're a little closer together. And I like the combination of two compressors versus one. I used to think when I would see people do this, I'd say, I don't get it, I don't get it. You kind of just have to try it. Like work on a mix where the vocal is sounding like this in the mix. You say that it won't be long. And then add the other compressor and listen to what it does to that vocal. You say that it won't be long. There's something about that, I'm gonna play it again for you, where the first one, the vocal feels like it's kind of coming in and out, like, like it's not quite sitting on top, just quite where I want it to, but I don't wanna turn it up because the peaks, the loud parts are loud enough, it's just those in-between parts. You say that it won't, it kind of like is jumping in and out. With this second compressor, those are all a lot smoother, and now I can kind of hear the vocal just kind of sitting nice and pretty right on top of the mix. You say that it Sorry, so here it is without it, and then I'll turn it on. You say that it won't be long. You say that it won't be long. It, you may leave a comment and say, Joe, I don't hear it. I get it. It's, it's one of those. It's fairly subtle, but I felt like it did make a difference. Now... Here's where we've gone, gone from here. I listened to this. Something about that second compressor is like sneaking that low end back up that I already cut out. You say that it won't be long. Right, it's a little thick down there. Um, so I instead of going back and adjusting one of the EQs before, that would mess up what's happening with the compression, and I like what's happening with the compression, so I add the other EQ after. And this is just kind of, let's get rid of some extra low end, and there was a little mid-rangey thing happening there. Here's what that sounds like. You say that it won't be long. You say that it won't be long. And you can see this is a little bit of a dynamic EQ. It's taming some of the top end a little bit. Um, and then the final piece of the puzzle, after all that compression and EQing, the sibilance was a little loud. So adding a de -er helped clear that up. You say that it won't be long. So you hear this by itself and you're like, well, it's a little thin sounding, Joe. Yep, but listen to it in the mix. You say that it won't be long. It's a little low in the mix. I think there was some automation there that's turned off. Um, and then the final piece for me is to add slapback delay, which is this. You say that it won't be long. Until I see it through new eyes While everything goes wrong Makes more sense to cut ties And I can't not let go Nobody can give me what I'm hoping not to find All I have before is find the time to leave behind And I can't not let go and See how that vocal, it just kind of sits right there. I didn't want it to pop out and be way on top of everybody in the band. Uh, I don't want it to be buried either. I, it might be a little quiet now that I listen to it now, but I think it sits like if here's the band, it's just sitting right there on that border where I can hear it and I don't lose it in the mix and that's exactly where I want it to be. There was more I wanted to show you today, but I think I'm gonna stop it there because that actually, that's a lot to take in. So I hope this was helpful for you. I hope it got you excited to go mix vocals and I hope giving you just a little glimpse into my thought process of how I kind of approach it helps you to feel like instead of just randomly twisting knobs, you've got a little bit more of a focus when it comes to mixing a vocal. Don't forget, before you go, head over to recordingrevolution.com slash checklist, get a free copy of this. This is wonderful by itself, but also if you do it before May 8th, you'll enter to win a free copy of my recording course, which is pretty cool as well. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.